Yeah, there we go. That's a little better. Let me try that again. Good morning again. Good morning. Boy, uh, that's the last song that they sang. All of them, really, were. Every one of them was about the cross. But, you know, you know the, the way home is through the cross. And that's our only way home. And uh, thankful that God made that possible. Jesus made that possible. And the uh, title of my sermon today is Unstoppable Love. We're going to be looking at Luke 23, uh, 32 through 49. But before we get there, I just want to say this. The soldiers could not stop him. The crowds could not stop him. The nails could not stop him. Even the grave could not stop him. Jesus overcame it all. And it's so important for us to realize that. And he did that for us because he loved us so much. Let's pray. Sovereign and gracious, gracious Lord, thank you so much for loving us the way you did. Thank you for sending Jesus, Lord, the gift of salvation. You were looking at his lowly circumstances and you, were cho you chose him to lift us up so that we may experience eternal life with you, which cannot be done without intercession, without the spilling of blood. And Lord Jesus spilled his blood every last drop to the last breath because he loved us so much. As he was in the garden, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. And he, and he said, but not my will, thy will. Why? For who? For God sent Jesus for this one purpose, that he may intercede for our sin, take it upon his shoulders, and be the last and final sacrifice that was ever necessary to stand before you, all those who believe. Lord, I pray today that we would have open hearts and open minds as we hear your word. And we hear what you, Jesus, went through on that cross for your great love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, so may I say first off, as I said before, good morning and also good Friday. I know it doesn't sound right because Friday is not coming until this Friday. But in essence, we won't be back again until when? Sunday. And next Sunday is Easter, and it's a resurrection day. Amen. That is so vital to this whole story. But the story begins on Good Friday. And today, since it's our last day, we today, on Sunday, before Friday, to celebrate that Good Friday. We're going to talk about the cross and what he did. So we're going to look at Good Friday today. And it's a very important day because it celebrates what we believe. And it's one of the most, you know, famous weekends, really, when you think about it, starting on Friday and ending on Sunday, you know, in history of the world and what happened. And we're going to look at part of that today. After Jesus' last Passover, right? And again, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be doing Passover today. Uh, we're going to be doing communion today. And at the last Passover, what did Jesus do? He did the Last Supper with his disciples. And how fitting is it that today we celebrate Good Friday. we celebrating what Jesus did. If this was Friday, we would be thinking that yesterday was Thursday. And today we're going to celebrate what he asked his disciples to do. And he said, do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. And we had it scheduled to do today. I just think that's just, just really neat. It's really a good opportunity. As we remember what he did at the Mount of Olives, Jesus took Peter, James, and John to Gethsemane, right, in the garden in the area. <laughs> and of course, he was a little annoyed that they couldn't stay awake long enough. They kept falling asleep as he was praying. And he was what? Full of what? He was experiencing anxiety over his coming torture and his gruesome death that he knew was coming. However, he also understood the greater agony that he would experience in what? Bearing the sins of the world. For the first time, Jesus would experience the shame of sin as he bore our sins. Remember, Jesus walked this earth as a sinless individual. He was the only one that has ever as we call them, the man God, to do that 
We can't do that. We can't be sinless. Nobody can. We want to be as good as we can be. We strive to do that as Christians. But Jesus did it. He was sinless. But what he was about to experience is a sin that he never experienced. And he knew that was coming. And that's a big deal. Throughout the night and the early morning, Jesus endured religious court hearings, civil court hearings, received a death sentence. They put a crown of thorns on his head. Then he experienced scourging. And then his weak and bloodied body, Jesus carried his cross to die. All those things were happening to him. So let's dig into this. If you would please stand for the reading of God's word. We're going to be digging into Luke 23, 32 for 40, uh, through 49. I'll be reading from the NIV. If you want to use a pew Bible, you can find it on starting on page 883. And this is what it says. Two other men, both criminals, were also led with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching. The rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if, it, if he is Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read this, is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour. And darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. From the sun, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness his, this sight saw what looked what, that took place, they beat their breast and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. I know that was a lot, but really that's the whole picture of the actual crucifixion. And I wanted you to get the whole picture. I mentioned last week the Passion of the Christ. Uh, the movie made by Mel Gibson uh, back a while ago. I don't, I don't remember the date, uh, but it was a while ago. Uh, we bought that DVD. Uh, yeah, an old DVD, full screen as a matter of fact, when I pulled it out. That shows you how old it was. Back in the old days, you had to get full screen because if you had a 40-inch tube TV, <laughs> I know it may sound foreign, but anyway, you had to get a full vision for it to fill in the whole screen. Anyway, we watched that yesterday as a reminder. I haven't watched it probably in 10 years. Uh, it's been a long time. And we say we're going to watch it every Easter, and we never do. It is a difficult movie to watch, but it's also a moving movie film to watch. It is the most realistic recreation of what Christ really would have gone through based on Roman history and what the floggings and the, and the cross, you know, look like, how they, you know, crucified people. And, uh, and they say, it's, and I think sometimes, again, I mentioned this last week, that we gloss over that. We want to look at the end result and I think it's important for us to slow down 
and really get a good picture of what he went through to stay on that cross, to even get there. And he did all of that because he, of that unstoppable love for us. I don't, what else would cause him to do that? Jesus' crucifixion in Luke 23, 32 through 49 teaches us what his death accomplished and as I said before, that unstoppable love that Jesus has for us. You can find his, the events of the crucifixion of his death described in each of the four Gospels. And I didn't put this up here for you, but it's Matthew 27, 32 through 56. You can also find it in Mark 15, 21 through 41. You can find it in Luke 23, 26 through 49. And you can also find the events of his crucifixion in John 19, 16 through 37. And you, and you, can, you deem different aspects of the crucifixion through those different expressions of it from their point of view. But they're all basically the same. The description of the, the, the first point is the description of the crucifixion, right? You know, and what was it, the part of it is, you know, the flogging. It was also the ascent to Golgotha or Calvary, you know. And it's, you know, it's from the final verdict at Gabbatha that we move to Golgotha. Which is, you know, like I said before, it's called Calvary. We're going to call it Calvary. To get there, Jesus must travel from Gabbatha, which was in the Roman quarter, all the way to Calvary, right? And before he was, you know, in, you know before he was to carry the cross, what, had, what was he going to go through? And when he went through a lot, he was scourged. And then he was paraded around the streets, as what? As an example. That's why the Romans did what they did on, in scourging, you know, people. Um, the torment that they put them through. And then they would parade them around as a warning to everybody else. For what? To keep them. To keep them in line. If you don't do what we said, this is what's going to happen to you. So they did that to Jesus. And of course, after Jesus left Pilate's judgment, which really, Pilate's judgment, if you really get down to it, his judgment was really no judgment at all because he judged him not to be deserving of death. He sent him to be scourged and to be, you know, uh, you know just that part. He was hoping that that would appease the people that were calling for his death. They thought, he thought when he brought them back and they saw how badly they had tortured him with these whips that had metal and glass on them as they whipped him and tore his flesh. That he thought that would be enough. But it wasn't. The crowd was still calling for his death. So what did he do? He wanted no part of this. He brought out a basin of water and he cleaned his hands. And he says, he said, this is not on me. This is on you. If you want to crucify him, you do. But my hands are clean. But still his guards had to do it. So because of what they wanted, he went along. Let me tell you what it was like after being scourged and tormented and partied around where people just slugged him and hit him and spit on him and disrespected him in every way possible. Then what did he have to do? He had to, he had to carry a cross. Let me tell you, the average cross back then, they figure, weighed at least 75 pounds. After suffering massive blood loss, and the torture and the beating that he took before he got to the cross, he was already near total exhaustion. No wonder why he buckles under the weight of the beam. He can't carry the cross another step. And what happens when he can't carry it another step? Matthew 27, 32 says this. It says, as they were going out, they met a man, Serene, 
named, from Serene, named Simon. And they forced him to carry the cross. Now, can you imagine being this guy? I would imagine that he was kind of on the tall side for that day. And he might have been pretty well built. So they picked him out of the crowd and said, hey, Simon. I would think, you know, I don't know about you. If you're watching something like this going on, you want to hide in the crowd. You don't want to be picked out. The guards went over and poked him with the point of the spear and said, nah, you're going. So he goes. He was probably there just for Passover, or he was just passing through town. We really don't know. Mark's gospel says that Simon was just passing by. He's on his way elsewhere, and suddenly this journey of life has, was permanently interrupted, wasn't it? He feels the press of that Roman spear. He's pushed out into the street, and the cross is hosted, hosted onto his shoulders. And he's told, you carry it. He can't carry it. You have to carry it with him and or for him. Simon, you, you know, would not have carried the cross for a total of 350 meters or about 382 yards. And listen, that's almost four football fields. Think about that. That's how far the journey was from where they were, almost four football fields. We don't know how long Jesus carried it. I don't think it was very long before, you know, Simon had to come in and help. But he did carry it most of the way, and that's still a long way. So I, my next point is the, the agony of Calvary. Jesus is crucified on the cross in Luke 23, 46. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. The ninth hour. So he was on the cross for what? A total of six hours. He was most likely stripped of his clothing. And then the actual con uh, crucifixion begins. The guards, what? They do what? They drive the nails through his hands and through his feet. And on top of them, they nail a sign that says, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, is nailed in place. With both feet extended and the toes down, the nails driven through the arch of each, leaving the knees you know, moderately flexed. Listen, there's a reason they did this. First, at that point, the person's completely crucified. And then when they're up on that cross, lifted up onto the cross, what happens? You slowly sag down, and the more weight on the nails and the wrists are, what happens to you? It's excruciating pain. Along, it goes through your fingers. Your arms are exploded with pain. And what do you do to take a breath and everything else? You've got to push up. You push up with your knees. You lift yourself up. To avoid what? To relieve some of that stressing torment and also to be able to breathe. Because you have your full weight bearing on those points. At this point, what happens to you? Your arms get fatigued. There's great waves of cramps and muscles knotting in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. Air can be drawn into your lungs, but they can't, you can't excel, exhale. Listen, because of the great weight, you can, you can you know, bring in a little bit of a breath that you can't get rid of anything because of all the, the structural pain on you. Jesus has to lift to raise himself up into what? In order to get you know, a short breath. You've got to lift that weight up. It's with great pain to be able to push yourself upward and exhale to bring life-giving oxygen back into you. It was undoubtedly something that, you know, during these periods that he, you know, is what these short periods when he did this would be the only time he could talk because he had to get a breath to do that. I want you to envision that. That great excruciating pain of him lifting himself up to be able to draw on some air so that he could talk. Let's examine the Lord's final words on the cross because I think they're so important. And that brings me to my second point, the declaration of the cross. Let's listen to the Savior's dying statements. All seven of them. 
is found in the, throughout the four Gospels, as I mentioned before. The first, looking down at the Roman soldier, you know, throwing dice at, this, at the bottom of the cross for his garments. What does he say? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The second statement that he makes is what? That he's talking to the thieves. He says, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise to the one who was asking for forgiveness. The third, looking down at John, his beloved apostle, he says this, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold, a sponge is soaked in cheap, sour wine, which was a staple drink of the Roman soldiers. It's lifted up to his lips, and he apparently doesn't even really take a sip of the liquid at that point. The body of Jesus is now in extremes. He can feel the chill of death creeping through his t tissues. He knew. This revelation of, that he knows that the time is drawing near, where he ushers in his six words, possibly little more than tortured whispers at this point, and he says this, it is finished. Yeah, it is finished. What he meant by that? His mission of atonement was completed. Finally, he could do what? Finally, at that point, he can allow himself to die, his body. With one, though, there's one more last, his seventh surge of strength. He utters his seventh... saying his last cry, his last utterance. And what does he say? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Wow. You know, the gospel writers simply say they crucified Jesus. Who crucified him? I'll tell you who crucified him. I did. We all did. Every one of us who call on the name of Jesus, we crucified him. Every time we sin, we bear more weight on Jesus. That's who did that. You and I did it. All those people that were around him did it. All those groups that were, you know, calling out to crucify him. They did it. But it would be more accurate to say this. We crucified Jesus. We crucified him because he had to come. That was always part of that. I always tell people all the time, you know, we try and make this more complicated than it is, but you see the Bible from Genesis, starting in Genesis? This, is, this, book, this book is all about Jesus. In the Old Testament, it was about the Messiah that was going to come to fix everything that was broken by who? Adam and Eve. We walked with God in the beginning. We were in His presence. Then we sinned and were separated from God. And from that point on, we continued to be separated from God and we needed to sacrifice animals. until Jesus came our final sacrifice. That was God's plan the whole time. Brings me to my last point today, and that is the death of Christ. The reality of his death. The rest, the rest of you know, in order that the Sabbath not be profaned, the Jews asked, the, you know, listen, you know, we've got to remember, Friday night is the beginning of the Sabbath. From Friday night at 6 until Saturday at 6 is the Jewish Sabbath. From sundown to sunrise. I say 6. It's really sundown to sunrise. From Friday night to... The Jews did not want anybody on that cross. At, at, when the Sabbath started, they had to have their slate cleaned. And that's when the Roman guards, how would they make sure that anybody that was still alive on the cross was no longer alive? How do you do that? You break their legs. 
That's right, you break their legs. And what, is that, what does that do? Well, they can't lift themselves up, they can't breathe, they die. And that's what they would do. Now remember, in the Old Testament it says that he would not have a broken bone. Well, Jesus dies before that. Before they could get to him and break his legs, he says his last words. And he goes. He dies, he passes. Well, one of the guards said, break his legs anyway and make sure. And the other guard looked at him and said, he's dead. And he's, the other guard says, well, make sure. So they stab him in his side to make sure that he was dead, to verify. And he was. They drove a lance through his ribs, upward into the ribs and into the heart. The 34th verse of the 19th chapter of the Gospel according to John reports, and immediately there came out blood and water. That is, there was an escape of water fluid from inside the body, which means that you were dead. All right, that's, that's what that is talking about. It's post-mortem evidence that our Lord died, not the usual crucifixion death by suffocation. He died another way. The consequences, what are the consequences of his death? How many of you have ever thrown a rock on the water? I know as kids I used to do that all the time, even sometimes trying to skip a, one if you found one, you know, uh, flat enough, you know, you could spin it. But anytime you throw a rock in the water, what happens? It sinks. Yeah, it sinks, yes. But it also creates ripples on the water. There's a ripple that goes out from where you threw that rock in. The bigger the rock, the bigger the ripple, right? Several things, that's what happened when Jesus died. Several things, because the ripple, when he died, there was a ripple effect. Think about that stone in the water. Several things happened at that moment that Jesus died. At the moment of Jesus' death, we read the following happened. In Matthew 27, 51, it says this, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and rocks were split. Listen. The curtain of the temple is torn in half from top to bottom. Listen, you need to understand what the curtain on the temple was. Otherwise, this doesn't make as much sense as it should if we understand exactly what it is. And, you know, in Mark 15, 38, it says this, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This veil was somewhere near 60 feet high. Early Jewish tradition says that the veil was about four inches thick, but the Bible does not confirm that measurement. And what was the veil? What, what was the reason for the veil or the curtain? Listen, if you don't know what happened, is the, the high priest that was designated to go into the altar had to prepare himself to go into the altar to make a sacrifice for the, for the sins of, of his, 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 their people at the time. And he'd put a robe on and had bells on. Not only did the robe have bells, it also he had, the high priest had what? A rope tied around his leg, one of his legs. Now people might say, that's odd. Yeah. You know why it's, but it's important. Because listen, the only person that could go behind the curtain and be in the presence of God in the, with the temple was somebody that was, who had been designated to do it and was prepared to do it. So why the rope around his leg? Because if something happened and he dropped dead, guess what happened? Nobody could run back there and say, well, I'm just coming to get him. <laughs> you can't do that. Because then you would fall dead. Now we've got multiple people dead, and we're waiting for a high priest to get himself ready to go in there and get these dead people out of there. No, he had a rope around there, so if, if anything happened, if he stopped ringing or you hear a thump, you just pull him out. Because nobody could go get you. So why is it so important when it says this curtain was ripped? Because when that curtain was ripped, there was, it was no longer a hiding place. That's no longer where 
you came to make a sacrifice because the ultimate sacrifice, which was Jesus, has just paid the price. No more sacrifices would be needed. So at that point, Jesus became what? The, the final sacrifice. In John 14, 6, what does it say? Jesus says himself, I am the way that no one comes to the Father except through who? Him. Not through the sacrifice at the altar. Now Jesus was what? The higher, superior high priest. And as believers in his finished work, we partake in a better priesthood. We can now enter the Holy of Holies with, you know, because of him. Hebrews 10, 19 through 20 says that the faithful enter into the sanctuary by the blood of who? Not an animal sacrifice, not presented by somebody else like a high priest. We do it through Jesus by the new and living way which we open, that was open for us through that veil being torn. And here we see the image of Jesus. Flesh being torn for us just as he was tearing the veil for us. There, there was a great earthquake, right? Many of the tombs that were thrown open, dead bodies were cast out. The text indicates when Jesus rose from the dead that many of the dead rose also. God's love is different than the, the natural human love. We always try to equate it, but there's a difference between agape love, the love of Christ. He loves really the utterly the unlovable. When Jesus died, he died for ungodly, for sinners, for his enemies. He died for us as sinners. Paul, you know, gets at how, how much, how this is so contrary to human nature. It doesn't make sense to us as humans. When he writes this in Romans 5, 7, and 8, he says, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though a good man, someone might possibly dare die, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While what? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I knew somebody that I believed was saved and they wouldn't, they wouldn't come forward and profess their faith. And you know why? It took them almost a year. Because this person was trying to clean himself up first. He said, well, I'm not, I, I'm, you know, I'm not clean, I'm not right enough. I, I got too many, too much baggage. I can't, I can't join the fold. I can't, I can't become a member. I can't actually, you know, confess my faith. But although every, but every outward sign said that this person was as much of a believer as I was at the time. Still. But they were unsettled in their own heart because they didn't understand this. First off, you're never going to get yourself totally cleaned up. But Jesus doesn't require that. He loved us, you know, while we are still sinners. That's why he died for us. He didn't say get all cleaned up. I often remind people about the thief on the cross. He didn't say, okay, I'm going to get you down from here. And when you do, you better not sin anymore. I want you to clean your act up and, do, and, and make sure that you earn your way into heaven with me. And he didn't say that. He said, today, right now, he confessed with his mouth and he believed in his heart. Now, we can't see people's heart, but Jesus could. And he said, today, you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Amen. It said that Martin Luther was observing a painting of a crucifixion of Jesus. And he was so deeply moved that he said, My God, my God, for me, for me, for me, for us. You know, look at that cross and you say, For me? You did this for me? I think that's huge. That is unstoppable love. That was the unstoppable love of Jesus. All this and the death of Jesus defines love. 
a love that we don't understand. Jesus' death wasn't just an act of love. It defines love in itself. It's substitutional death. It's the ultimate example of what love means. Agape love. Jesus calls those to follow him to walk in the same kind of life, laying down love. What did he do? What did he do when Peter pulled out his sword and cut the ear off the Roman guard that was trying to arrest Jesus? He told him to stop. Peter didn't understand what was going to happen, had to happen. Jesus did. And he knew that that kind of fighting at that time was not the answer. So much has to calm Peter down. And also, at the same time, he restored the Roman soldier's ear. In 1 John 3.16, it says this, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. John Piper explains this. He says, Jesus' death is both guilt-bearing and guidance-giving. It is a death that forgives sin and a death that models love. It is the purchase of our life from, you know, uh, you know from perishing in the pattern of love, life of love. Jesus' crucifixion teaches us that because he, by taking our punishment, he is our redeemer. Let us thank God for Jesus' what? Unstoppable love. Nothing could stop Jesus. Nothing. Because he loves us that much. And listen, we don't deserve it. Not one of us. Because we are all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. But that's not what it's all about. It's about restoring us. It's about faith. It's about love. So what do we have to do? All we have to do is give our heart to Jesus. As I've said on many Sundays after, you know, Sundays at the end of sermons. Romans 10, 9 through 13 says it nowhere better. Where it says, if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, you will be saved. That's it. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Where do we get that from? Thief on the cross? We don't have to do some kind of mental or physical gymnastics. And what I'm talking about is works. Now, you know, works without faith is another sermon for another time. But all that means is that if, if there is time for you, that the evidence of Christ will see, be seen in things that you say and do. As simple as that. I want to remind you again um, that uh, next week is Easter Sunday. And don't forget, it's also a great opportunity to invite friends and families to church. Invite them for Easter Sunday here as we celebrate. Because, you know, listen, without the resurrection, without Jesus defeating death, we're gonna, we'll talk about that next week, how important that is. That shows that he is who he said he was. Because he said before he died, I, this temple would be re rebuilt in three days. Unfortunately, the Pharisees, you know, and the Sadducees thought that meant their physical temple. He was talking about his body. Because he is the temple. Not the temple that was ruined in the earthquake and the, and the veil that was ripped that could no longer be of any use. Let's pray. Lord, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your sacrifice. Lord, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know how you did it. I know I don't deserve it. I thank you for that unstoppable love that caused you to not run away. That caused you to say, Lord, if there's any other way for this cup to pass, but not my will, thy will. Lord, may I be as obedient to your calling as Jesus was. Lord, may I continue 
to remember that and to think about that. You did not come to kill and destroy. You did not come to, to pass on judgment. You've come to give everyone the opportunity. Everyone who calls on your name. Everyone. All the sinners of the world have an opportunity to be with you in paradise forever. Heaven. Lord, thank you for that opportunity. Lord, may we be more willing to share the good news. Lord, in a world that seems upside down today. Lord, people, you know, Lord, you promised, you told your disciples, if they hate me and if they persecute me, they will hate and persecute you. Lord, that was a promise from a long time ago. And Lord, it's still true today. Lord, people don't like what we say. And Lord, it's not that we say it as I always say to people, don't get mad at me. <laughs> get mad at God. God said it. I just repeating what God says, and I believe what he says. Lord, may we have a, you know, a new generation of strong, convicted people for the truth. Your truth, it doesn't change. It's the same now as it was over 2,000 years ago. May we honor that and realize that and choose to follow you and what you ask us to do. And Lord, I just want to end by just re saying it one more time. Lord, thank you for that unstoppable love that caused you to hang on a cross for a sinner like me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.